Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, coming this morning. So today we have Dr. David Garcia with us. He is a professor of medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine and assistant medical director for antithrombotic therapy at the University of Washington Medical Center. His clinical research interest is in hemostasis and thrombosis, particularly cancer-associated thrombosis, the treatment of warfarin-associated coagulopathy, and periprocedural anticoagulation. He is a member of the American Society of Hematology, as well as the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. Dr. Garcia is a member of the board of directors for a number of organizations, including the North American Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, and the Thrombosis and Hemostasis Societies of North America. He is the immediate past president of the Anticoagulation Forum, a U.S. national interest group of anticoagulation care providers. In addition to, be, to being either an investigator or steering committee member for numerous clinical trials related to the prevention and treatment of thromboembolic disease, he has authored or co-authored peer-reviewed publications in journals such as Blood, New England Journal of Medicine, the British Journal of Hematology, Stroke, and also Circulation. He was very involved with the development of the most recent American College of Chess Physician Guidelines on Antithrombotic Therapy, and is a special editor for evidence-based focus reviews at Blood. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Garcia. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Dr. Tran, and good morning to everyone. I'm going to talk today about uh, cancer and venous thromboembolism, and it's a real pleasure to be here in Atlanta. I just disclosed that I have served as an occasional advisor to a couple of different pharmaceutical companies. Uh, mainly, these are companies that manufacture the so-called direct oral anticoagulants, which I will mentioned for part of my talk, so you can put my comments in, the context, in that context. This is the outline of what I'm going to discuss today. I'm going to cover a number of mostly clinical subjects that come up for not only hematologists, but I know there are also oncologists in the room, and uh, hopefully most of these subjects will be relevant to both. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on pathophysiology because I think there's a lot more to understand and it's quite complex in terms of the reason for the relationship that cancer and thrombosis uh, share. Uh, I will talk about <clears throat> screening for occult malignancy in patients with unexplained thrombosis. I'll discuss the problem that's becoming increasingly frequent of patients with unsuspected uh, or incidental so-called <clears throat> pulmonary embolism, particularly in the subsegmental arteries. Um, we'll talk about the issue of how long to treat and, and with what in patients with cancer-associated thrombosis. Um, I'm going to try to convince you that it's not prime time yet for the so-called direct or target-specific oral anticoagulants. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about primary prevention. So. <clears throat> um, I think everyone in the room knows the, about the strong association between cancer and thrombosis. It's uh, sometimes surprising to colleagues when I tell them that 20% of cancer patients, people diagnosed with a malignancy, will ultimately develop venous thromboembolism during the course of their illness. And on the reverse, if you just look at epidemiologic studies of patients with DVT-PE, about 20% of them will have cancer either at the time their thrombosis is diagnosed or sometime within the year uh, afterward. Thrombosis is a very important uh, cause of death in cancer patients. And uh, interestingly, it's um, not only associated with cancer, but when a cancer patient has a clot, we can infer that their disease is particularly aggressive and it has, as I'll show you in a moment, implications for their uh, prognosis. So this is an interesting epidemiologic study that's now several years old, which highlights some of these concepts, which is showing you that for a patient with neither uh, cancer nor thrombosis, their mortality rate you know, is that of a general population. It serves as a reference uh, 
If you develop thrombosis or cancer, obviously your, your mortality rate statistically increases, but if you develop both, the uh, effect on mortality per 100 person years is, is dramatic and um, exponential in its increase. The <clears throat> Again, thrombosis is a marker of aggressiveness of disease, so patients who have metastatic uh, disease or regionally invasive disease tend to develop thrombosis at a more frequent clip than patients whose cancer is more localized. And this is true across various different tumor types, although the absolute rate of development of thrombosis varies a bit depending on the type of cancer uh, primary. Within each tumor type, there's a very reliable relationship, if you will, between localized, regional, and regionally metastatic, and it's very remotely metastatic disease with respect to the cumulative risk of thromboembolism. Thrombosis tends to be very front-loaded. That is, it, the majority of thrombosis events happen within three to six months of a patient's cancer diagnosis. If a patient's going to develop thrombosis, it tends to happen earlier. Um, and I think what all of these various epidemiologic uh, relationships tell us is that, again, thrombosis is a marker of aggressive disease and um, clearly has a strong relationship to malignancy itself. One of the challenges that we have in determining how to prevent thromboembolism in patients with cancer is that the risk for thrombosis is highly variable across tumor types. So if you look at a number of different uh, cancer sites here on the y-axis, and then the incidence rate of thrombosis per 1,000 patient years on the x-axis, you can see that uh, different studies, and there's five, four, five, six studies for each of these that have been published and then meta-analyzed, you can see that while the overall risk is about 1.3% annually, or 13 per 1,000 patient years, it's, it's extremely variable. It's lower in, in tumor types such as breast and prostate, but much higher in pancreas, brain, and not shown on this slide, other genitourinary cancers. So uh, this is a challenge for, I think, oncologists and their patients um, coming up with either ways to study this or ways to make clinical decisions that apply across different types of cancer. And I think that's one of the things that's held back the research in this area a little bit. The mechanism for why patients develop thrombosis in cancer, again, I would say it's not worked out completely, and that's probably because it's so multifactorial. Just like thrombosis outside of the setting of cancer, which is almost always multi-causal, in our patients without malignancy, I think it's, it's almost always going to be multi-causal in a patient with a tumor. So obviously cancer uh, cells themselves can secrete tissue factor or promote <clears throat> hypercoagulability of the blood uh, uh, biochemically. There are lots of reasons that the endothelium gets injured, whether it's the placement of catheters or the administration of chemotherapy that's toxic to endothelial cells. Uh, or inflammation induced in the endothelium by the cancer or the body's response to the cancer itself. There can obviously be <clears throat> uh, lots of reasons for, for venous stasis, whether it's immobility because the patient's ill uh, following a surgery um, or simply just tired from their chemotherapy, or whether it's direct compression of a tumor on a large blood vessel we can get uh, turbulence or, or abnormal blood flow and venous stasis in cancer. So it's really uh, not hard to think of lots of reasons for this very strong association that has been observed repeatedly over the years. At a biochemical level, I think there's a lot of uh, ideas. This is a paper published now almost 10 years ago going through various proposed mechanisms, again, probably all of which have something to do with um, uh, with the mechanism or the explanation. I, I always tell the medical students, whenever you see a diagram this complicated, it means we don't really understand what's going on. But um, suffice it to say that it, it's been proposed that the secretion of mucins by adenocarcinoma may promote certain interactions between platelets and white blood cells, which may, uh, again, affect uh, the endothelium and 
cause thrombosis. That way, it's been proposed that certain tumor cell types secrete tissue factor, which obviously is prothrombotic via the extrinsic uh, pathway. And uh, many, other, many other theories have been proposed as to why cancer actually makes the blood uh, hypercoagulable. So <clears throat> given this strong association that, again, is not going to be a surprise to anybody in the room, um, I want to go through a series of practical clinical questions that, that come up uh, for those of us who see patients. And one of these is maybe not as relevant to oncologists, um, but it certainly comes up among internists, and that is, if I have a patient with unprovoked DVT or PE, should I go on a so-called fishing expedition to look for an underlying malignancy, um, either to provide an explanation for why the patient had the clot in the first place, or more importantly, to perhaps offer them a better chance of successful treatment of their cancer if it's identified early. And indeed, again, if you look at patients who've had unprovoked thrombosis, over the six months after their diagnosis, 9% um, and then another 1% or 2% in the following six months, they will have a cancer discovered, much a higher rate of cancer discovery or manifestation than among patients with provoked clot, such, a po such as post-surgical clot or OCP-related clotting. So, it, so when you see these kind of numbers, it really is tempting to say, well, maybe we should be looking harder at the time of the initial thrombosis diagnosis for that, um, for that unprovoked, uh, excuse me, for that as yet not apparent cancer. Um, and indeed, you can, it's been shown in historical studies that an extensive evaluation, such as doing a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, will increase the proportion of previously undetected cancers at the time the patient presents with thrombosis, uh, compared to a more limited screening strategy. Unfortunately, a large percentage of patients already have widespread disease when the cancer becomes clinically evident, whether that's at diagnosis or of thrombosis or later. And until recently, the question of whether this early detection could translate into better survival really had not been answered. And so that's why some investigators, um, primarily in Canada and France, conducted this randomized control trial that was published uh, last year, in which they said, well, let's take a bunch of patients who've had uh, an unprovoked DVT-PE and random randomize them to undergo a limited screening approach looking for an underlying tumor versus a more extensive screening for cancer, which included comprehensive CT scanning and other things that I'll describe um, in a moment. The patients were then followed uh, similarly in both groups for 12 months, and the primary outcome measure was uh, undetected cancers discovered later. So this, these are the strategies of the screening. The limited group got basic blood tests, like a CBC and a chemistry panel, chest x-ray, and then they, it was ensured that they were up to date on age-appropriate screening. The patients were uh, uh, obviously would underwent more evaluation if any of this basic screening dictated they should do so. Um, but in the other group, in the comparator group, Patients got, all patients got a comprehensive CT of the abdomen and pelvis in addition to those other things that the limited screening group got. And this was quite uh, sophisticated with biphasic enhanced CT scan of the liver, parenchymal pancreatogram, et cetera. Um, and the, again, the primary outcome measure was confirmed cancer that was missed by whichever screening strategy they were initially assigned to and detected by the end of follow-up. So there were 33 patients who had cancer uh, detected. You can see 14 in the limited screening arm and 19 in the um, more extensive screening arm. But there was really no difference in the primary uh, outcome measure, the time to um, missed occult cancer detection, if you will. So you can see here that by the end of the study, the two curves had basically caught up with each other, and the handful of 
patients that were found after initial screening was done was not different. Four in the limited screening arm and five in the more extensive uh, screening study. And this was not an um, important difference, either relative or absolute. They looked at key secondary endpoints, such as how often did they detect early cancers with the more extensive versus more limited uh, screening approaches. They looked at overall mortality, and they looked at cancer-related mortality, and were unable to show a benefit in any of these um, outcomes using this more extensive screening strategy as compo compared to the limited one. So the conclusion, I think, is uh, pretty uh, definitive that this, ex this approach of looking extensively for cancer at the time of an un otherwise unprovoked uh, venous thrombosis is probably not beneficial, at least on a routine basis, for uh, our patients. Well, what about the problem of unsuspected pulmonary embolism? So this, again, is increasingly common as we have a better and better technology with CT scanners and uh, our patients with a variety of different solid tumors are going to the scanner for stage restaging uh, or evaluation of response to therapy. And Perhaps the cancer is looking better, but the radiologist gives us a call to say, oh, by the way, there's a filling defect in the, you know, one of the segmental uh, pulmonary arteries that we didn't expect to find. Um, some institutions report rates over 5% of these, so, the, these so-called uh, incidental PEs. That is, of all the PEs diagnosed, one out of every 20 is incidental. Uh, they tend to be more common in patients in the hospital, in patients who are older, and obviously uh, in patients with cancer. Um, for patients with cancer, these asymptomatic clots have now repeatedly been shown to be associated with a worse prognosis. So this was a study from an Italian group which looked at 62 pa such patients. That is, these are individuals who had an unsuspected uh, PE mostly, but some of them had DVT, uh, diagnosed uh, in the setting of background malignancy. All of them were treated with anticoagulation, but there was a very disturbingly high mortality rate at six months despite the treatment of their uh, thromboembolism. They compared this cohort of patients to some controls of similar age, tumor stage, et cetera, and it, the, the suggestion is that it's much worse to have a clot in the setting of your cancer than not if, you, if all other things are uh, equal. A similar sort of result emerged from this uh, study from a group in Southern California where, again, unsuspected PE was compared, patients with unsuspected PE were compared to patients who had not had unsuspected PE but were otherwise similar. And you can see there appears to be an association with uh, worse survival. Um, we, used to, we used to think that, well, maybe these incidentally detected pulmonary emboli are uh, not associated with a high rate of recurrent disease. That is not, not associated with the same risk of recurrent thrombosis as patients who have symptomatic events. But that um, idea has also been dispelled by this and other studies, which indicate that actually the recurrence rate, Kaplan-Meier curves sort of sit right on top of each other, whether your PE was detected incidentally or was associated with uh, symptoms. So uh, at least for patients with large clot burden, even if it's detected incidentally, I think most oncologists, at least in the US, uh, based on this kind of uh, information, most oncologists and hematologists think that we should, should treat these patients with anticoagulation, although I would, that's still controversial. The subgroup of patients who, for whom I think there's more uncertainty at the moment is patients with these so-called subsegmental um, pulmonary emboli, particularly when, it, again, there was no clinical suspicion that they would be there in the first place. Um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty among clinicians, both within the cancer population as well as outside of patients with cancer, is what should I do if, if my patient has clot isolated to the subsegmental pulmonary arteries and I wasn't even sending them to the scanner for a PE uh, in the first place? And you can see this is not a small 
uh, problem, a lot of these unsuspected events are occurring in the subsegmental uh, branches. Well, um, there's some data, and again, the evidence is mixed here, but there's some data such as th uh, this study indicating that if you kind of pull these subsegmental PE patients out of the uh, overall pool of patients with unsuspected pulmonary embolism, they may have a, a different biology. That is, that in this case, their survival probability, which is shown on the y-axis, is comparable to that of patients who were otherwise similar but had not had an unsuspected pulmonary embolism. Uh, so they don't, at least in this study, these patients with unsuspected PE that's confined to the subsegmental arteries appear to be behaving differently from patients with unsuspected PE that's involving larger pulmonary arteries. Uh, again, suggesting that maybe there's a different uh, biology to this. Another study that's emerged in recent years that, that suggests that maybe these subsegmental, maybe we're picking up pulmonary emboli that are not uh, all that clinically important is this one, and let me just walk you through what these investigators did. So they looked at historical studies of patients um, with pulmonary uh, embolism. Uh, th these were studies looking at um, CT, scan, CT scanning to detect PE. And you can see that the percentage over time as the technology gets better toward the right of the slide, the percentage of patients who had a subsegmental PE as opposed to larger pulmonary emboli uh, increased. But um, interestingly, the outcome rates for recurrent DVT PE and death due to thrombosis did not change in these studies over time. So you would think that if back here, when in the age of single detector CT scanning, we were missing a lot of pulmonary emboli, right? Because uh, the difference between 15 and 5 percent is substantial, and there had to be a lot of subsegmental PEs that were not seen at this time, and yet there wasn't a significantly higher rate of um, failure of therapy, if you will, or recurrent thromboembolism, suggesting that maybe there's not, um, and here I'm just showing you the, that, those rates, suggesting that maybe the importance of detecting these subsegmental pulmonary emboli is not that great, and that in fact we're just uh, finding noise that's uh, leading our patients to take toxic therapies that they might not need. So it's not definitive, but it, but it certainly is cause for uh, uncertainty. There is a um, study that's going to try to address this that the same investigators have initiated. It's an observational study. Um, taking place mostly in Canada, and they're targeting 300 consecutive patients with subsegmental pulmonary embolism. Uh, they can't have larger PE or other indications for anticoagulation. And they're going to withhold anticoagulation in all these patients after getting their consent. Now, they're going to exclude cancer patients, so I don't know how much we'll be able to apply this study to, to the cancer population, but it, it, it is, I think, going to provide some really important information to test this hypothesis that perhaps isolated sub subsegmental PE, particularly when it's unsuspected or incidental, is uh, of limited clinical importance. Um, most patients with cancer nowadays, of course, are treated with low molecular weight heparin monotherapy at least for six months. The so-called uh, CLOT study, which is the landmark trial more than 10 years ago now, compared daltaparin in this particular regimen here to um, warfarin therapy uh, in patients with cancer-associated thrombosis and showed that the daltaparin-treated patients had uh, a significantly reduced rate of recurrence without excess bleeding. And other studies have confirmed that. And so the NCCN and ACCP now recommend that low molecular weight heparin monotherapy be used for at least uh, six months. What we don't know is what's the benefit of continuing low molecular weight heparin after six months. I'm sure all of you have um, had patients sitting in your office uh, saying, I'm really tired of doing these injections. They're painful. I've got bruising. They're expensive. And um, so this 
study that I'm going to just talk about for a couple of slides now tried to look at the marginal benefit of extending daltaparin therapy beyond six months in patients with cancer-associated thrombosis. And not surprisingly, uh, there's a front-loading of both major bleeding and thrombosis events. Uh, are, the, are the principal findings of the study. So you can see that over a one-year period of daltaparin use, about 10% of these cancer patients had major uh, hemorrhage. But there's a front-loading of that where way over half the events are occurring in the first six months, and indeed more than a third of the events are occurring in the first month. So you could say, well, extending beyond, um, beyond month six is associated with some additional hemorrhagic events, um, but many of the major bleeds will have already occurred by that time, so perhaps you know, your conclusion could be, well, it's reasonably safe to continue the therapy. The problem is, on the flip side, most of the thrombotic recurrences have, have already happened. So let me just point out that this rate of recurrent thrombosis here 8.7% is almost identical to the six-month recurrence rate of thrombosis to the original clot study that was done by uh, Aggie Lee in 2003. Um, again, showing we still have room to improve on our treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis if almost 9% of our patients are having recurrences uh, despite best available uh, therapy. But you can see that the recurrence has continued to happen in the second six months of daltaparin use, just at a, at a much lower rate. So while, while the drug gets safer in the second six months of therapy, the, the risk of thrombosis is probably lower during that time. And so what, whether, it has a lot of, whether it continues to have the benefit over other less expensive, less burdensome treatments, I think is, is still unresolved and a question that that we really don't know the answer to. One of the things that <clears throat> I use, at least informally, when I'm asked by colleagues, well, should I, should I keep going with the low molecular weight heparin, or can we stop treatment altogether, or can we switch to, say, an oral uh, alternative, it is, is I try to th think about, well, what's this particular patient's risk of having additional thrombosis in the future? And this is not a perfect clinical prediction rule, but it's one that I think can be helpful because it identified some factors shown in the first three bullets here, which are independently associated with uh, increased risk of recurrence. And then they found that breast cancer and not surprisingly localized cancer were associated with a decreased risk for thrombotic recurrence. And so an, a different group has shown that using this clinical prediction rule, you can stratify cancer patients into risk of uh, recurrent thrombosis uh, if they've already had a clot in the past. And these are mostly patients who have stopped their anticoagulation, but um, it, it, I think it still points out that there, are, there is room to individualize the approach. And I would certainly say that for patients who, based on this kind of scoring system, seem to have a low risk of recurrence, it may be reasonable to stop treatment altogether or certainly to switch to something less aggressive and less burdensome than low molecular weight uh, heparin. Now, I think that what, what we could, would ideally be doing it someday in the future is not using low molecular weight heparin at all uh, or certainly being able to switch from it to, 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 a more, to an easier drug to take after, say, one to three months. And as you guys all know, there are several drugs now approved in the U.S. I have not listed adoxaban here, but it's another factor 10A inhibitor that's on the U.S. market for the treatment of DVT-PE. Um, and this is an email that a colleague shared with me, but I get similar ones uh, with some frequency. It's sent at 4.23 p.m., probably on a Friday, and it says, a patient of mine with recurrent endometrial cancer was admitted elsewhere with a PE. Her doc started her on Xarelto. She'll come back here for chemo in a couple of weeks. Is Xarelto treatment effective enough for cancer-related PE? If you need to see her, I'd be happy to refer to your clinic. Thanks. 
And so this is not an unreasonable question for an oncologist to ask. Uh, indeed, these drugs have been approved for, uh, again, stroke prevention in patients with atrial fibrillation, as well as the treatment of DVT-PE. And, and there's nothing in the label uh, indicating the drugs for DVT-PE saying that they can't be used in patients with cancer. So if you interpret the label literally, there would be no reason not to use them in a cancer patient who has a DVT or pulmonary embolism. Um, and indeed, uh, groups have published subgroup analyses of the DVT-PE registration trials looking at patients with cancer. So these acronyms listed on the left here are the trials which tested these drugs against warfarin in patients with DVT or PE. And what we're looking at in these relatively small numbers, and I want you to focus on the fact that these numbers are small, 595 versus 537, um, are the people who were classified as having, as, as having cancer in these DVT-PE treatment studies. Now, keep in mind that um, investigators in these trials knew that any patient who enrolled in the trial had a 50% chance of being randomized to warfarin therapy and a 50% chance of getting one of the DOACs, or direct oral anticoagulants. So um, we'll come back to that thought in a moment. But at least compared to warfarin, the pooled data and the individual point estimates suggest that in this group of patients with cancer, these direct oral anticoagulants um, look promising. And from a safety standpoint, uh, there's also a similarly reassuring signal in this small subgroup of patients. Uh, and furthermore, we had a number of groups present abstracts, either in poster or oral form, at last year's ASH meeting, where uh, they described that at their center, they were beginning to use one of the direct oral anticoagulants. Most groups were reporting on rivaroxaban, and they were describing small to medium-sized you know, consecutive series of patients where they had, in some proto local protocol, been routinely giving cancer patients these agents and saying, uh, the outcomes are good. People are doing fine. There's no re there's low recurrence rates, low bleeding, et cetera. But of course, we all know the challenges with observational uh, data that doesn't have a comparator. Nonetheless, I think um, there's, a, there, there's sort of a call among oncologists to sort of say, hey, we're, we're tired of these injections and these, actually, these direct oral agents are actually cheaper. This is ridiculous. What are we waiting for? We're, we're kind of fed up with the current situation and we need to move to something else. But uh, I, I just want to remind everybody who's ready to start using these drugs in cancer patients of, of a couple of things. So first of all, let's go back to why are we using low molecular weight heparin in the first place? Well, again, it's based largely on this 2003 very large 700 patient study, as well as other studies that confirmed that compared to warfarin, low molecular weight heparin is just more effective. Um, I also want you to recall that, again, the subgroup analyses I showed you a moment ago, which I'm re-showing you now, are not comparing the direct oral agents to low molecular weight heparin. They're, they're comparing them to warfarin. So they're not being compared in this analysis to the, the best available treatment. Secondly, the absolute event rates in the vitamin K antagonist treated group are fundamentally different, as I'm going to show you in a moment, from the event rates in this vitamin K antagonist uh, uh, treatment group. What do I mean by that? Well, this is just looking at the raw number of recurrent VTE events in the tr patients randomized to warfarin from either the historical trials that established low molecular weight heparin superiority or the DOAC trials where there were some small numbers of cancer patients. And look at the difference in, in the rate at which warfarin failed. It failed much more frequently in the RCTs where low molecular weight heparin was the comparator. And that's because, I think, these are, this is more sort of typical real cancer patient population, uh, these are highly selected, cherry-picked, if you will, individuals uh, 
who, quote, had cancer, but found their way into a trial comparing, say, apixaban to warfarin for the treatment of pulmonary embolism. And so I don't think we can conclude from those subgroup analyses that, uh, that the DOACs are going to be as effective as low molecular weight heparin or, or are going to be adequately effective in patients with cancer. The good news is we will, um, I think we will have a lot more information about this in the not too distant future. So these are several uh, trials of, of varying methodologic quality that are underway, all I believe sponsored by industry. But this trial, and, and full disclosure, I'm, I'm the US national coordinator for this study, comparing adoxaban to daltaparin is, going, is a randomized controlled study enrolling 1,000 patients. We already have uh, 800 or so enrolled uh, internationally. And the primary endpoint is going to be a composite of recurrent VTE and major bleeding. And I think we will get a definitive answer because we're using daltaparin in the way that it was used in the CLOT trial. Um, and uh, we're including both suspected and unsuspected pulmonary embolism and DVT. And I think uh, you, you'll probably see results from this study in the summer of next year, perhaps ISTH uh, Berlin. So I think there is a possibility that we'll be giving cancer patients oral therapy for their uh, thrombosis in the next year or so, but uh, we're not quite there yet outside of clinical trials. The last thing I'll touch on before uh, leaving some time for questions is the idea of primary thrombosis prophylaxis. So given, and I, and I alluded to this earlier, but given that we know that our cancer patients are at such high risk to develop thrombosis, during the, particularly during the treatment uh, stages of their disease, should we be giving something, to making, taking some intervention in ambulatory cancer patients before they develop um, a clot. And this question comes up uh, frequently for patients who have to get admitted to the hospital for some chemotherapy just because it can't be given uh, in the outpatient arena, either because they need methotrexate levels checked or, uh, I don't know, they're on dose-adjusted EPOC-R or something that can't be done in the clinic. But the patient feels perfectly fine. They're walking the halls, and yet the nurse is coming into their room every 12 hours saying, I need to give you your injection of your whatever, heparin or Lovenox. And they say, well, I don't, you're not giving that to me at home, so why am I getting it here? And there's really not a rational answer to that question. Um, and, and indeed, there may be some, some outpatients who would benefit from uh, prophylaxis. And there are probably also some inpatients who are getting it and don't really need it, but that's another story. So the challenge, again, is that there's this wide variation in patients with cancer. Cancer is such a wastebasket term, as everyone in the room knows, uh, that you know, it's, it's hard to apply any strategy to that whole population. Um, what I think we do know is that the concept that we can prevent clots in cancer patients has been proved. I'm not subjecting you to all the slides I have on primary prevention studies, but both treatment doses as well as prophylactic doses of various anticoagulants, mostly low molecular weight heparin, have been compared to placebo in various cancer populations. And I would say that the concept that we can prevent symptomatic thrombotic events has been proved. The problem is that the number needed to treat has been unacceptably high. Even when you use treat, so-called treatment doses of low molecular weight heparin, which are starting to expose the patient to some risk of bleeding, uh, a lot of the studies were showing you've got to treat 50 to 100 patients to prevent a single symptomatic thrombotic event, which is just not acceptable to patients and oncologists. It just doesn't get on their radar screen of things that are important, uh, considering everything else that's going on. People have, at, have said that there's signals, and, and again, these have been pulled out of pooled data from the various trials. Maybe preventing VTE actually will uh, improve survival of cancer patients. I would say that's still an unproven hypothesis. It hasn't been completely disproven either. 
Um, but the bottom line is we need to identify patients who are at high risk, high enough risk where we can really justify the costs and the burdens of um, primary prevention. And there's a number of, I, there's still a number of investigators working on this. I listed one um, study sponsored by one of the DOAC manufacturers uh, that's on clinicaltrials.gov where they're using the so-called Corona score, a clinical prediction rule uh, developed uh, at the University of Rochester, to identify patients at especially high risk of thrombosis and random randomizing them to either rivaroxaban or uh, placebo with the idea being that they can show a clinically important rate of preventing symptomatic events for a cost and risk that would be reasonable and burden that would be reasonable and, and acceptable to most patients. So I'm going to stop there. I've covered a lot of ground and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.